new security model in GigaSpaces RAP 701. Please feel free to send us your questions during the webinar using the chat tool. We will respond to your questions during the webinar as well as at the end during the Q&A session. Also, during the webinar, you will be prompted with a few polling questions. So once these questions come up, simply choose your response so we can learn from each other on our op opinions and preferences. I wish you an enjoyable and interesting webinar and urge you to fill out our survey at the end of the webinar. Your input is viable to us. I'll now pass the mic to Uri. Everyone. Thank you, Maya. So, uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Uri Korn. I'm the product manager for Gigaspaces. And today we're going to talk about uh, the new security framework uh, for Gigaspaces XAP, uh, the drivers behind that, um, and what it means uh, in, in both virtualized and non-virtualized environments. So um, our agenda for, for this session is, first of all, a, a few brief words about Gigaspaces. Um, then we'll introduce Gigaspaces XAP, our flagship product, uh, and talk a little bit about uh, um, what it does and, and how a typical application would look like uh, uh, once deployed on, on Gigaspaces XAP. Uh, then we'll talk about the drivers or the motivation behind our new security implementation and why uh, we decided it is important to, uh, uh, to come up with this offering uh, uh, now of all times. Um, we'll then dive into the details of what this uh, framework provides and how to use it. And finally, we'll, uh, we'll see a live demo on EC2 on the cloud uh, and we'll show how to secure uh, a standard uh, web-based application without uh, changing a single line of code or configuration. So without further ado, let's start. Uh, a few words about Gigaspaces. For those of you that uh, don't know it uh, well, um, Gigaspaces um, is uh, uh, a leading provider of, uh, of a grid-based application server, enabling applications to run on a distributed cluster as if they were a, a single machine, and basically, basically bringing the power of the grid uh, to, to users, um, we have more than 300 direct customers, and uh, out of which 75, or even more than 75, are using the cloud or using Gigaspaces on cloud environments such as EC2, um, and we're considered uh, to be among the top 50 cloud vendors uh, in the industry. Gartner actually sees us as a leading provider of XTP and cloud-enabled application servers. Uh, from the list of customers you see here, you can see the Gigaspaces is applicable to, uh, to a lot of verticals, starting from, of course, the, uh, uh, the financial uh, arena or the financial services, uh, uh, the financial services um <coughs> type of companies. You can see here big names like Dow Jones uh, and other big names that we cannot mention publicly, which are part of, uh, of leading Wall Street companies. Um, other applicable uh, verticals to Gigaspaces are uh, online applications, online web applications such as Marktplatz, which is the Dutch uh, uh, affiliate of eBay. Um, media applications like Bazoo here um, and other telecom applications. So uh, the point here is that Gigaspaces is widely applicable and basically any, any online service, any online application that requires high performance, uh, predictable scalability, is, uh, is, is can use Gigaspaces. So moving on to uh, Gigaspaces XAP. Um, so the vision behind XAP is to enable, uh, is to provide basically an end-to-end -end solution uh, for developing and deploying enterprise applications on a single platform. Uh, if you take a look at this diagram here, you can see that the traditional way or the typical architecture of enterprise application uh, involves many components, starting from the uh, web server or the load balancer, from, uh, and going through the app server, the messaging server, uh, and the app server typically is deployed in a cluster, and then ending in a database cluster. Now, throughout a certain transaction, uh, all those components typically communicate between one another, creating some sort of ping pong, and uh, uh, thus adding to the latency and to the uh, uh, and limiting the scalability, the overall scalability of the application, adding uh, cluster topologies even uh, limit this uh, further, because now we have to replicate everything uh, uh, to at least one other machine. Uh, one other thing that's worth mentioning here is that uh, both messaging and database are 
are heavily based on, on, on the disk for reliability. So their ability to perform um, uh, low latency transaction is very limited. Now the idea behind Gigaspace is XAP is a bit different. Basically what we're talking about is taking the messaging tier and the data tier and the application server or the business logic tier and condensing them into one single process or one single uh, uh, scalable unit. And scalability is not done by adding more layers or by, uh, by adding more servers to each machine. It's basically done by adding more of these processing units and distributing the load or the work uh, between them. So if, you if you're looking at a single transaction, basically, instead of uh, hopping through all these components back and forth, we're talking about uh, hopping through virtualized components or, or uh, uh, in-memory components and thus enabling very, very low latency and very good scalability. Now, the database still stays in the picture, of course, um, for long-term storage because not everything can fit in memory. Um, and what we enable our users here to do is to asynchronously yet reliably uh, offload data into the database uh, such that it, it, it will be available uh, for longer term purposes such as data mining, such as uh, analytics, and all those applications that, uh, that do require uh, a relational database to long term storage. So moving on to the next slide, um, I mentioned it a bit uh, in, the, in the previous slide. Um, the idea behind Gigaspace is, is to enable uh, linear scalability or predictable scalability. So if you have one machine, you can do one, th you can support 1,000 users. Then you add two machines, you can support 2,000 and so on and so forth. And this is not something that is evident or something that, that is easily done with traditional architectures. Now the way to do that is using what we call uh, the space-based architecture. And basically this is a software pattern or an architectural pattern uh, that was designed to enable linear scalability from the ground up. And it was inspired by uh, Java Spaces. For those of you that know it, it it's, an, it's, an, it's a specification from Sun Microsoft, Microsystems and by uh, Yale Stuple Space Mall. And of course, uh, by lessons we learned from, uh, uh, from uh, customers that we've uh, dealt with uh, throughout uh, the years that we exist. The idea behind SBA is, again, to uh, condense all the middleware services such as messaging, such as data access, such as business logic, uh, into one single processing unit and do that in memory. So every time you do messaging or you do data access, it's done in memory. And the way to scale those processing units is simply replicate them and create more of these uh, processing units across multiple uh, hardware resources. And Gigaspaces takes care of dynamically balancing the load between those components and enabling the application to scale. So when you add another processing unit, basically, we can route more uh, of the workload to it and thus evenly distribute the workload across the cluster. So there's no really an inherent uh, bottleneck or, or uh, uh, point of contention within this uh, architecture. Now, underneath this, uh, uh, this middleware virtualization, or so to call middleware services, sits our data grid. Um, just some brief history, Gigaspaces originally started uh, as a data grid company. And uh, still our data grid is very core to our value proposition. And it's, you know, uh, it's one of the best data grids. Uh, we, we were not, we were not, done, uh, we're not attesting to ourselves. You know, it's considered uh, by, uh, by leading uh, um, industry specialists to be one of the leading data grids in the market. And it's still a core foundation of our value proposition. But the nice thing about it is that all of those services, middleware services, are actually based on this data grid. So we use the data grid as the, as the backbone for those services and perform both data access, event processing, remoting, and MapReduce type of uh, uh, callbacks on top of this data grid. The data grid provides the partitioning, the discovery, um, the, the, the data storage, the querying capabilities, and we built all those services on top of this data grid. And that means that those services, uh, uh, being based on a data grid, are now much more scalable because the data grid itself is more scalable, have mu much higher performance because it's in memory, um, <coughs> and basically enable you to scale infinitely uh, as much as you need by just adding uh, more machines into the mix. Um, 
So these are the middleware services that we provide uh, as part of the uh, as part of the mix. Um, um, the term middleware virtualization actually means that uh, using this underlying data grid, what you can do is you can treat uh, an entire cluster as if it was uh, one single resource. And, and for example, if you're talking about event processing, you can treat this entire cluster as if it was one giant messaging queue and get messages from all the members of the cluster uh, virtually transparently. Um, and so on for, uh, for messaging or for remoting even, you can actually invoke services uh, in parallel on all the nodes of the cluster because the data grid resides on all those nodes and then uh, um, you can get much higher performance by distributing the load between those uh, those nodes. Now, the the the, uh, the uh, underlying infrastructure that the, data grid, that the data grid provides here is, of course, high performance, high availability uh, through in-memory replication um, uh, to peer members in the network, scalability. Um, the data grid itself, of course, is transactional, so ev all of those services can or can or it can can be transactional if you choose to make them transactional. And the last thing, it provides also security. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So to summarize the, uh, the overall architecture of Gigaspaces XAP, um, basically we have the, uh, the virtualized clustering or virtualized middleware layer in the middle here, which provides those uh, uh, data, grid services, AppReduce type, uh, type of services, and messaging services. Underneath it, we have the deployment virtualization, which basically enables you to take uh, 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 one piece of deployment unit or, or a jar file and deploy it in one click uh, across all of the cluster. And it's just a, a deployment decision to choose whether you want to deploy it on two or five or ten machines. <coughs> and this deployment virtualization layer is uh, uh, is also uh, uh, enabling the uh, the SLA-driven capabilities of the platform. So it's not, it, it not just deploys the application on those, uh, on those uh, machines, it actually monitors them at runtime and, and makes sure that everything runs properly. So for example, if one machine or one service fails, the deployment virtualization there makes, takes care of uh, reinstantiating the failed service on another available machine. Or another nice feature of, the, of it is that it can monitor uh, the uh, the real-time load on the application and decide to scale it dynamically, for example, add another instance if the load becomes too high, or even decrease the number of instances if the load is very low. On the side here, on the right, we have the XAP uh, monitoring and management tools. Uh, uh, we're talking about, of course, the, uh, a graphical user interface that enables you to see what's going on in the cluster. And more recently, we're talking about uh, uh, a very comprehensive administration monitoring API that again enables you to uh, uh, to utilize the information exposed by, by this uh, deployment virtualization layer and actually take smart decisions at runtime on the application. Now at the API level, Gigaspaces uh, supports multiple APIs or multiple development frameworks, most notably Spring and Java. Um, the entire deployment model in Java is based on Spring, uh, so if you're familiar with Spring, uh, you know, using Gigaspaces uh, should be a breeze for you. We also have built-in uh, Java EE support, uh, which I'll describe uh, uh, in the next slide. And Gigaspace also enables .NET and C++ clients uh, to access uh, to access the data grid. Other supported uh, uh, frameworks are, are Groovy. For example, you can you can dynamically send Groovy code across the cluster. Uh, to be executed in parallel. Um, <coughs> we also have a nice integration with Mule for those ESB scenarios, uh, enterprise service bus scenarios, and other frameworks that we integrate with. Um, now, the last thing I wanted to mention here at the bottom is that uh, uh, Gigaspaces can run uh, both on virtualized and non-virtualized infrastructure, uh, which is, of course, uh, you know, nothing new and nothing special. But um, what Gigaspace is special in is because everything is virtualized, because really the uh, decision when to uh, uh, how, how many machines to run on and whether or not to scale dynamically is something that's built into the platform, then uh, it can make uh, much better use of virtualized environments, such as cloud, for example. So uh, referring back to my uh, uh, 
to my previous words on, on, on how uh, applic application load can be uh, uh, dynamically measured and, and dynamically cause the expansion of the application, in cloud environments, for example, what you can do is you can actually instantiate new images on the fly uh, when the load on the application increases. So you can actually use this kind of on-demand uh, uh, availability of, uh, of uh, resources to scale your application dynamically. So um, <clears throat> last thing I want to look at here, um, and, and we'll later use this diagram to uh, to understand uh, what the uh, security framework of Gigaspace includes, is uh, how a typical Gigaspace application would look like. Um, and you can, we can see here a number of, uh, of layers. Um, the first layer is the grid services layer. Okay, we can see here a grid service manager, a grid service container, which is available for all of these uh, uh, application components. And basically, this is the Gigaspace infrastructure running uh, within the network. The grid service container basically is responsible to run uh, application instances. For example, if I have a web application um, and it has multiple instances, then each instance would typically run in a separate grid service container. If I have a data grid deployed, then each of the data grid uh, instances would run on a separate grid service container. And the grid service manager, which we see here, is the component that actually responsible uh, to manage those grid service containers and the applications deployed on them. And again, this is the part, this is the component that's responsible to monitor them in real time, to expose information about them, and to take smart decisions uh, whenever something uh, happens, whether it's bad or good. Now, if you're talking about uh, a web application, um, <coughs> so of course we have a typical set of, uh, of, uh, of uh, web containers. Um, and the, the difference between uh, the regular or, I mean, plain Tomcat or Jetty uh, configurations to Gigaspaces is that unlike uh, those static uh, components, Gigaspaces can grow and shrink dynamically. So that means that there has to be some sort of load balancing uh, integration that enables the load balancer, whether it's Apache or, Apache or another uh, type of load balancer, uh, to discover uh, the new instances in the network or to, uh, um, um, to remove failed or, uh, or uh, shut down instances from the load balancing configuration. So Gigaspaces does enable it to do this very easily, and we integrate uh, with Apache, for example, to enable dynamic configuration of the load balancer. And we'll see that also in the demo. Now, um, the web container that actually runs within those uh, grid service containers is Jetty. Uh, this is the default web container that comes with Gigaspaces. Um, <coughs> the added value services that we provide on top of uh, the usual Jetty services are, of course, HTTP session. Uh, high availability on top of our in-memory data grid. So this is the web tier of the application. Now, the business logic and data tier are based on the Gigaspaces data grid. So uh, a typical deployment would be what we call the partition deployment, where we have two partitions. You can see it uh, here and here. These are two partitions. And uh, typically, they would be deployed in a highly available configuration, meaning that uh, each partition is backed up uh, by at least one, one backup. So everything that happens in one partition gets automatically replicated to the other, and if one partition fails, then the other can take over as if nothing has happened, okay? Um, now, in terms of uh, interacting with the data, of course, the uh, web container can query the data grid. The web containers can query the data grid dynamically, or they can use uh, higher-level services such as remoting, such as MapReduce, uh, such as messaging, which are all enabled by the data grid. So instead of having a separate layer, a separate tier uh, to host the data and the business logic, basically everything is done in the data grid and is scalable and is done in parallel. So every time, for example, the, uh, the web application uh, uh, wants to invoke some sort of query, it can do that in parallel on all the partition. And this is, just, this is just two partitions, you know, there can be 50 or 100 partitions for that matter. Okay, um, so we talked about partitioning. Uh, another, another thing worth mentioning here is co-location. So, for example, if there is a business logic service that you want to invoke, 
Eagle Spaces enables you to, uh, to uh, very easily co-locate it with the data grid uh, instances. So whenever something needs to be done on the data, it is done locally, thus enabling very, very uh, high performance, very high performance and, uh, and, uh, and scalability because everything is partitioned. The async persist persistency bit is something I already mentioned. Uh, again, everything that's done in the data grid can be asynchronously propagated to the database. And because the data grid is deployed in a highly available topology, we don't need to do it synchronously. You know, it's enough for us to do it uh, in the background without having to worry that, uh, uh, that we have a single point of failure or that something will be lost if we don't save it immediately to the disk. The last bit, and this is again something more recent uh, as of Gigaspaces 7.0, is uh, the proactive administration capabilities using the Gigaspaces 7.0 administration and, ma and monitoring API. What you can do is you can create uh, a processing unit or a piece of the application that would actually be aware of what's going on with the application at runtime. And think of it like a, a um, for example, like a person, okay, a, uh, an employee, for example, that uh, if he feels tired, he knows that he has to go to sleep, or uh, if he feels uh, awake, he knows that he, that he can go do a, a jogging or something. And the same thing applies here. This type, this component actually feels the application and knows what to do with it at runtime. So if the load increases, for example, and the number of web requests go above a certain predefined threshold, then this Administrate, uh, proactive administration unit can actually instantiate another web container and have the load balancer route request to, to it. And vice versa, if the load decreases, then we can kind of shut down this instance and everything, of course, is transparent to the end client of the application. So um, now that we talked about, we understood how a typical Gigaspace uh, application looks like, um, I want to kind of share with you a bit of our uh, motivation or the drivers behind why we chose to implement uh, data grid security at, at this point in time. So um, the first thing that uh, kind of uh, we're seeing in the last two or three years, I would say, is, is a shift or a transition uh, from kind of plain caching solutions uh, to uh, what we call enterprise-wide in-memory data grids. Uh, and that means that instead of having uh, a separate cache for each application, typically containing redundant information because, you know, for example, a certain piece of data can reside in both caches, thus uh, using resources unnecessarily, then we're seeing a shift of using what we call an enumerate data grid or an enterprise data grid that's kind of an organization-wide data grid that has all the benefits uh, in-memory storage and scalability of an in-memory data grid, but is something that more than one application shares with, with other applications. So we can cache data here, and we can have both application A and B access the same data, not having to replicate it uh, across all the, all the applications in the cluster. So basically, uh, this is a more scalable, more efficient, uh, and more consistent model. Um, consistency, of course, comes from the fact that we have only one copy of the data instead of two. Um, but that means that, that there are new requirements now uh, because it's no longer an isolated service in each application, and that means we can no longer rely on every application to provide security for its own cache. So we need to come up with some, uh, uh, some more uh, sophisticated security mechanisms because, uh, because at this point it becomes very similar, for example, to a relational database that you have to uh, secure regardless of the application that are accessing it. Uh, another very important trend that we're seeing is that uh, in-memory data grid in many, in many applications actually becomes a system of record. Uh, and, and these are mostly uh, you know, applications that require high throughput, uh, high, high rate of, of updates uh, on the data, uh, which, it, which a relational database or any disk-based storage cannot support. So we're making the in-memory data grid actually a system of record, which even uh, amplifies further the need to make it uh, more secure because it's not just caching uh, data from the database, which is the real system of record. It's actually storing the data in memory, and then it's, this is the system of record that you need to protect. 
So this is one motivation behind uh, why we need to, uh, uh, to provide a better security for an for our database. Now another very important driver is virtualization and, and cloud computing. Uh, and these both uh, drive us to think a bit differently on, on the way we deploy applications. Because we understand now that uh, resources are available on demand, on demand. And typically we only pay for what we use. And since we all want to, uh, uh, to cut, cut on our costs, we want to use as less as possible. So if I'm going back to the previous slide, obviously this type of configuration, the central in-memory data grid configuration, would mean less memory capacity that you need from uh, hardware on the, on, uh, from uh, um, machines on the cloud. So this is one very important driver. Um, <coughs> Another thing that, uh, um, that, that cloud uh, computing also introduced is, 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 of course, new security uh, uh, challenges. So we're talking about, first of all, isolation. Um, uh, naturally, if I'm talking about data grid, this is data isolation. For example, uh, having one application access uh, one subset of the data and another application access a different subset. But it's not just isolation at the data level, it's also isolation at the application level. If you're talking about Java, for example, uh, you don't want uh, uh, the same uh, binaries. Um, um, for example, if you have two applications that they are using the same library but have different versions, you don't want these versions to interfere with one another. Um, and, and, and that's why we need the better isolation. And of course, uh, um, when talking about cloud environments, you know, uh, and, and, and we talk about big organizations, enterprises, one of the main inhibitors uh, for moving to the cloud is the fact that they don't, uh, they're reluctant to put data on the cloud, proprietary data on the cloud, uh, both you know, from uh, um, confidentiality and compliance reasons. And gigaspaces in that, in that uh, respect is a much better fit than databases because typically gigaspaces would work entirely in memory. So what you can do, you can actually load the data from an on-premises uh, uh, data store Send it off premises to the cloud to the in to the in memory uh, um, environment of gigaspaces, and again once the uh, once the application shuts down once you're done using the cloud, everything is is uh, it's, it's a much safer uh, bet to uh, to think that everything gets erased because it was only in memory it was never written to any disk so in that sense, gigaspaces provides a better answer um, to um, uh, to virtualized environments. Okay, um, now let's go for a quick poll. Okay, so just before we continue, I'd like to launch a polling question to our audience. So here's the question. You have a minute to quickly respond. When are you expecting to have a multiple application sharing, sharing the same data grid on or off the cloud? Okay, so in a few seconds, I'll close the poll. We now have 55% voted. So those of you who haven't responded yet, please tell us what you know or what you think. And I'm closing the poll in five seconds. And the poll is closed. So let's share our results. We now see that 50% voted 12 months or more. Okay, Oli, we are ready to move on, so please do continue your presentation. Thanks, Maya. Okay, um, so let's just make sure everyone see my screen. All right. 
So um, the next thing uh, we're going to talk about uh, is actually the, uh, the details on XAP security framework. So we get to the uh, to the chase here. Um, so before I want to talk about that, uh, I want to kind of uh, give you a brief overview about uh, various aspects of security. You know, it's a general overview, not necessarily related to gigaspaces. What are the uh, uh, you know required security services that you would expect from uh, uh, from any enterprise solution? Um, so the first one is of course authentication, the ability to uh, to actually uh, make sure or verify that a certain party is who they say they are. Typically, this is a username password type of mechanism, uh, but there are other mechanisms like certificates, uh, uh, biometric uh, authentication, all those mechanisms. Um, but this is a foundation to everything else. Uh, the next service is uh, authorization and access control. Basically, once you have authenticated a party, then what this party can actually do with your system. Um, and what are they authorized uh, uh, to do? So typically this is done via permissions, roles, and access control lists. The next aspect is uh, confidentiality and integrity. Um, if you're talking about uh, a network or, or network-enabled systems, then if you exchange data or communications between two or more authorized parties, then how can you make sure that this data remains confidential and remains integral, meaning that uh, no other party can actually modify or tweak this, this data and change it uh, en route. Uh, and the most common solution to this uh, in modern systems is, uh, is SSL. And the last thing is, uh, is uh, auditing uh, or the ability to actually uh, hold users accountable for what, for what they do. So basically, we want to work record. We want to know um, um, whenever someone does something on our system. For example, a failed authentication attempt, or a successful authentication attempt, and then some sort of operation that that, uh, that caused uh, something to happen, something bad to happen. So we need to have all this information available to us on demand, and that's what auditing is all about. So going back to the uh, general XAP architecture diagram, um, let's see what the new security framework actually enables in terms of uh, in terms of those security aspects. So the first thing is, is SSL support across all communication channels. Uh, naturally, Gigaspace is, is, is a grid-based uh, product. And, and of course, there is a lot of communication running uh, between the services, between the services and the manager. Um, uh, when replicating data uh, between the data grid uh, members when pushing it down to the database. So everything. Uh, uh, everything uh, here passes through the network and uh, can be secured uh, via SSO. <coughs> Next thing is authentication and authorization. Uh, Gigaspace provides, a, uh, the new framework provides a username password based uh, authentication mechanism, uh, which of course can be extended to support more sophisticated uh, authentication scenarios or authentication mechanisms. Uh, and uh, on top of that, we provide a uh, very comprehensive permission system that enables you to assign permissions to specific users or to uh, create roles and then assign those roles to, uh, uh, to groups of users. Um, and what these roles enable you is, is, first of all, control the administrative operations you do on this, uh, on this environment. So if you want to deploy an application or undeploy an application or monitor what's going on with this application, uh, in a secured configuration, you would need to, uh, to have permissions to do that. At the application level or at the data grid level, we're talking about securing uh, data access, um, both in terms of uh, which operations you can do in the data, such as read, write, uh, um, delete, or even execute code on the data grid, and which data type you're accessing. So you can actually say, okay, one user can access um, um, this type of data, for example, accounts, and the other user cannot access this type of data. It can only access, for example, uh, um, um, uh, some other sort of administrative information. So this is the level of control that, uh, that uh, we enable to, uh, uh, to do out of the box with this uh, framework. Um, <coughs> so this is, I mentioned already, the, the secured grid components uh, and deployment and monitoring permissions. 
And of course, this security is supported throughout uh, our management interfaces, specifically our graphical user interface, as we'll see in the demo, our command line interface, and of course, the new administration and monitoring API. So you can just create uh, an administrative client via API and hook into a running secure system. You will need to log in first and have the proper permissions to do that. Um, <coughs> Okay, so these are these are the uh, the capabilities of this framework. Um, now, in terms of audit, uh, audit, uh, auditing the system, uh, we provide detailed audit trails uh, via our log files. So basically, everything that's done in the in the system, no matter where uh, on which component it was done, for example, accessing the grid service manager or one of the grid service containers or the data grid for that matter, it's recorded. Uh, uh, via our audit trails, and you can then, uh, uh, you know, review it offline and see uh, what happened uh, in the system. Now, uh, how it works. So basically, um, the SSL support, which is actually the only thing we will not demonstrate in this demo, um, is, is is detached of all the of the, of the authentication authorization. Basically, you can enable SSL support uh, without enabling the authentication and authorization and vice versa. Um, when you do enable SSL on Gigaspace component, this is kind of an all or nothing decision because the system is only as strong as its weakest link and basically we do not enable you to create kind of partial uh, uh, encryption or partial SSL support across components. If you are using SSL, then that means that every piece of communication, whether it's between server components or client to server or client to server communication uh, is made secure and is uh, uh, and is done through over SSL. Now the authentication authorization uh, mechanism is something that we will see in this demo. Um, <coughs> first of all, when you want to secure a Gigaspace components component, the way to do that is by uh, introducing a very simple system property uh, for all, all of the running components. Um, and the default implementation currently comes with a file-based uh, directory. That means that all the users' permissions, roles, everything is saved in a file in a file-based uh, format, basically a, a security directory file. Um, and this file uh, should be shared across all the uh, running components. As we're talking about this red environment, sharing can be done either via uh, a shared file system like NFS. And we also provide uh, mechanisms to do a more uh, a smarter sharing, for example, via HTTP. So we can specify an HTTP location and point all the services to that location uh, for better concurrency. Uh, we'll talk about later uh, our future plans on that regard. Um, now, in terms of, uh, of security uh, uh, configuration, there are two main files in the system that you need to be aware of. The first one is the security configuration file, which basically controls uh, various security aspects, um, such as the authentication authorization provider. Like I said, the default provider is file-based, uh, but you can create uh, providers of your own, and we, in the future we plan to provide them more types of providers, and we'll go over that in a second. Um, how uh, to encrypt uh, the password and the content, for example, in that, uh, in that file. Um, and uh, where, where is the security file located? For example, you can uh, designate for an HTTP server instead of a file system location. The users enrolled directory file itself basically contain, is encrypted and contains the list of users and roles that, uh, that you have created and should uh, be applied to the running system. And we'll see that in a second. Now, the API itself is an open API. Um, basically, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's publicly exposed, uh, so you can actually uh, extend this API, almost every aspect of it, um, uh, to integrate with uh, third-party authentication authorization mechanisms. Uh, like I said, currently, only the default file-based implementation is provided out of the box. Um, in the future, we plan, first of all, to integrate with Sprint Security such that every, uh, so every uh, um, um, type of integration that Spring Security already has will be also available uh, uh, to, uh, to Gigaspace's users. 
for example, we're talking about LDAP, uh, RDBMS, Kerberos, NTLM type of authentication uh, mechanisms. And of course, we plan to uh, to create our own built-in uh, LDAP and RDB RDBMS uh, um, authentication authorization uh, providers. Okay, so so the bottom line here is that this API is very simple. It's uh, by the way, it's modeled uh, after the Spring Security API. So if you know this API, it should be very easy for you to uh, to integrate with the Gigaspace API, and um, you can actually implement uh, almost any aspect of, of the authentication authorization mechanism yourself. Okay, uh, we'll go now to the next question in our poll. Okay, so in a few seconds I will uh, launch our second poll question. What are your key security assets in a distributed environment? Okay, we have one minute for this poll question. Okay, we have 73% voted. So those of you who haven't responded yet, please tell us what you think. Okay, I'm closing the call in five seconds. And the poll is closed, so now let's see what we've got. We have 50% voted for authentication and 25% voted for confidentiality. Okay, Uri, we are ready to continue. Okay, thanks, Maya. Um, so without further ado, let's go to the live demo. Um, a, few words, a few words about the demo application that we're going to use. Um, basically, it's it's the uh, uh, classic Spring Pet Clinic application, uh, but we've made a few modifications to it uh, uh, to be a, a more scalable and more performing. Uh, the main change that we did is that the, the web application itself doesn't interact anymore directly with the database. It's actually interacting with an in-memory data grid and uses that as a system of record and the data grid itself propagates the data asynchronously uh, to the relational database. So basically what we're going to do is <coughs> we're going to secure the grid components first, or at least we're going to talk about how to do that. Um, we're going to create users and assign permissions to them, and then we will deploy uh, uh, the application in a secure mode. Now the deployment of the, of the application will involve First of all, deploying what we call a mirror service. The mirror service is the part that's responsible of communicating with the database and receiving the, uh, the data that was uh, uh, updated on data grid asynchronously. We will deploy the, the in-memory data grid itself, and then we will deploy the web container and see how it can be uh, how it can be made secure. All right. Um, so. The demo itself is running on Amazon EC2 on the cloud. So what we see here in this screen, in this web browser screen, is our cloud portal, gigaspaces.com slash mycloud. And I already started the application cluster. So we see here that we have a number of Amazon instances. One of them contains the MySQL database. One of them contains our grid service manager. One of them contains a load balancer, and three of them contains uh, what we call web container machines that contain the Gigaspace containers and uh, will uh, eventually uh, be running uh, the, uh, all the application components. And we have another machine which we use as a UI facade. And that way what we can do is we can actually uh, um, use uh, our uh, the Gigaspace user interface 
uh, and treat it as if it was running on our local desktop, uh, although that uh, in, in, in reality it's actually running on the cloud. So this is the uh, uh, basically the uh, uh, the components that we see here, and we can see that <coughs> in terms of hosts, basically we have a number of running Amazon instances. You can see here these are the grid service containers that are running on our network. Um, <coughs> now the reason that uh, that I know these components are secure is that if you look at every icon here you can see a small kind of lock, red lock on it. And that means that this component is secure. And the fact that the, 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 the lock is red and it's not open, it means that I haven't yet logged into those components. Now, if you recall previously, the way to, uh, uh, to enable security on those components is by simply adding uh, a simple system property uh, before running those, uh, uh, those components. And that way they become secure. Now, <coughs> what I'm going to do next is try to uh, deploy an application. Okay? And you can see that the GSM on which I'm trying to deploy is actually secure. And when I try to deploy, basically I'll get an error message that says that I'm unauthorized to do it because I haven't yet logged in. So what we're going to do next is we're going to create users and assign permissions to them so that we'll be able to deploy uh, uh, our application. Now, just as a side note, you can see that uh, some of the functionality is still available in secure mode, mainly around, uh, you know, uh, resource utilization, uh, some general details regarding the Gigaspace versions you're running, system properties, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, for example, more uh, um, 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 destructive or, or restrictive operations such, such as opening a J console on this JVM are not yet enabled because I haven't yet logged in and I don't have permissions to do that. So the security, the new security menu in 701 uh, contains uh, two main items, uh, one related to logging in and logging out and one is managing the, per the security uh, information. And as you can see here, basically uh, we can actually log in and start creating users and roles. Um, this integrates very nicely with uh, the open APIs I mentioned before. So right now what it's going to do, it's going to create those roles on a file-based, uh, on, the, on the default file-based uh, authentication provider. But if you choose to implement a different authentication provider and implement all its functionality, then this, this UI would actually be able uh, to access that authentication provider instead of the file-based configuration. So we can see here that we have uh, uh, only one user, admin. This is a default user uh, that comes bundled in with the system. And it contains um, <coughs> basically just two permissions, manage users and manage roles, which enables me actually to do what I'm doing now. Um, but you can see that uh, uh, once I edited this user, basically uh, there are a lot more permissions I can assign to it. So um, if we look at the groups of permissions, we're talking about administrative uh, uh, type of operations, for example, monitoring the JVM or monitoring a running processing unit, and uh, managing the grid, basically um, deploying and undeploying processing units, um, starting and stopping grid components such as the GSM or GSC, or even managing a PU, restarting a PU, or, 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 or shutting it down. Then at the application level or the data grid level, we, are, we have a bunch of permissions that correspond to data grid actions, such as read, write, take, execute, and uh, alter. Alter basically means that you can uh, um, uh, you know, drop a certain class definition from the data grid or clean the data grid altogether. Now, those uh, permissions basically can be uh, assigned to a specific class or a specific package. So, for example, I can specify permission to only write uh, to uh, uh, classes of package, uh, for example, com dot gigaspaces dot star. So that means that all the classes in the com gigaspaces package, uh, uh, I will be enabled to write them or read them or do uh, any other operations that I assign here. Now, so for the purpose of the demo, let's create uh, two types of users. 
we'll call the first user grid admin and assign a simple password to it. Uh, this user will be able to do all the grid management activities and that is monitor uh, the running components and control uh, uh, the deployment and undeployment of processing units. So that's the first user we'll create. The next user we'll create is um, the application user. We'll call it Pet Clinic. And we'll give it data grid permissions. Okay. And in this case, I'm not filling out any, uh, any class specific permissions. I'm just adding uh, uh, um, permissions for all of the classes. Okay, so once I've done that, basically the, the, secure, the shared security file will be updated. Of course, what I could do is actually add roles, okay, and assign permissions to them. And then, you know, I can assign those roles to the users, okay? And then I can see kind of an aggregation of the permissions of, of, the, of the assigned roles and the user-specific permissions. Okay, but we won't do that now. All right, so now that I've done that, uh, what I can do, I can actually log in. And let's log in as, as grid admin. Okay, and, and once I try to log in, I see uh, what we call an authentication monitor or report on all of the components that are currently running. Basically, since it's a distributed environment, what we have to do is we have to log into each of the components. And what we see here is a report that says whether we succeeded or not. And basically, I see that everything is green, that, and that means that everything um, uh, has been logged into successfully. And now you can see that the icons actually changed, and they are now green instead of uh, red, and, 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 uh, and, the, and the lock itself is open instead of closed. So now let's go about and deploy the application. So the first thing I'm going to deploy is the mirror service. This is the service that actually responsible um, for communicating with the database and propagating uh, the changes uh, uh, asynchronously to it. And uh, basically what I did here is I provided uh, uh, deployment time properties such as the database URL, username, and password. So I'm deploying that. It will only take uh, a minute. Okay, there we go. And we can see it deployed here. And now I'm going to deploy the data grid itself. Okay, basically these are just jar files and the reason I'm seeing them in the drop down here is because I already deployed them once and, uh, and these are taken from the deployment cache. But this, these could be any jar file that are accessible to the user interface. And in this case, uh, I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm specifying that the data grid is secure, okay? And that means that everyone that is trying to connect to this data grid will have to go through the security mechanisms. And I can do it via the UI, or I can even do it uh, as part of the uh, processing unit configuration. In this case, for example, we can see here the commented outline it basically says that uh, I want this uh, uh, data grid instance, we call it a space, to be secure. Okay, but you know, it's, it's not such a good habit to, uh, uh, to save passwords and uh, usernames uh, uh, in free text. So I'd go back to the original option, which is using the UI for that. Okay, so what I'm doing now is I'm uh, specifying a username and password. Basically, these, this username and password uh, will be used by any uh, component that's internal to this uh, processing unit, to this data grid processing unit that's trying to access the, the, uh, the data grid. Okay, the next thing we'll do is we provide again uh, the, uh, the JDBC details since data grid loads data from the database uh, dynamically at startup, kind of doing a, what we call a cache warm up. Okay, this will take a few minutes, a few seconds, I hope, actually. Okay, and there we go. 
everything was deployed successfully, and we can see the data grid instances already deployed. Now we can also check what we call the space browser and see that the object count in each of the instances is not zero. That means the objects were loaded from the database. And the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to deploy the web application itself. And again, I want to provide a username and password since the data grid, since the uh, web application actually accesses the data grid. So we want to make sure that it accesses it properly. Okay, and we don't need to provide any details on the, on the database here because the web application doesn't communicate uh, with the database at all. Okay, and just to mention again, this is all uh, done at uh, real time on EC2. Okay, so we've deployed the web application. We can see it deployed here. And just to make sure that the application is, is functioning properly, basically what I'm going to do now is I'm going to first of all check the load balancer. And we can see that we have a new uh, uh, routing uh, uh, directive here in the load balancer. That means it's going to route instances, it's going to route requests to, the, uh, to this uh, uh, instance here. And to see the application through the load balancer, we'll just go in to the application directly. And we'll see the, the familiar pet clinic uh, opening screen. And of course, I can query for, uh, uh, for all the data and see what's going on and edit uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do, just to show you that uh, the same data grid uh, uh, can, can uh, treat differently uh, uh, different types of clients, is I'm going to deploy the pet clinic application under a different name without providing it security. Okay, I'm not going to uh, secure it now. And basically what this means is that the same application, the, same exact, the exact same application, will now not be able to access data grid. And, and, and this is one example. Another example could be uh, assigning it a different user, a user with different permissions. So that one application accesses one subset of data and another one accesses another. So let's de deploy that now as well. We call it Pet Clinic 2. <coughs> and here you go, it's deployed. And we can go back to the load balancer screen and see that the load balancer got dynamically updated. We see here Pet Clinic 2 as well. It has actual routing on it and routes to a running uh, web container. And if we go to Pet Clinic 2, which is a different deployment, and try to do something, uh, something meaningful on the data, basically what we'll get is an exception. And the reason for that exception is that no authentication details were provided. And that means actually that, uh, uh, that the data grid rejected uh, this application from accessing, from accessing uh, the data. Okay, so what we saw here is, is uh, you know, very simple. Uh, uh, a few steps to secure the entire running cluster. And, you know, think of, uh, don't think of a four machine cluster, think of a hundred machine cluster. And, and, you know, this makes this mechanism much more powerful. Okay, so with this I conclude the demo. Um, let's go back to a, a short summary and recap uh, what I've talked about here. So, uh, <coughs> First of all, security is, is, is as important now as it ever was. You know, uh, we talked about the drivers uh, for uh, uh, securing uh, grid-based application today. Uh, the first one being virtualization and cloud, and the second one is uh, you know the, 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 the shift in, in how people use data grids and uh, uh, the enablement of what we call multi-tenant applications or applications that access the same uh, data from uh, different locations. Um, <coughs> So in-memory data grids are no longer application specific, and we need to treat them as any other component in our system, such as a database, such as a message queue, which means we have to assign security to them. And that's exactly what, uh, what this new framework enables you to do. Um, and, and the XAP security framework provides all levels or all aspects of security, uh, namely authentication, authority, authorization, confidentiality, and then auditing. Um, 
So with that, uh, basically, uh, I'd like to conclude um, and, 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 and open, the, open the floor for questions. Uh, just before we do that, um, here are two links that will enable you to kind of get yourself familiar uh, with this framework. Uh, the first one is, our, is, is the documentation for this framework and how to use it. And the second one is uh, our product download page. So uh, questions now, Maya? Okay, Uri, thank you very much. Uh, we do have uh, some time for Q&A. We will try to answer as many as possible, but please note that we will publish all, the, all of the Q&A uh, later on. And the first question, Uri, is um, what about replication? What type of security do you provide for re replication? All right, so uh, basically replication is secured uh, <coughs> via SSL, as I mentioned before. And, and of course, there are lower level mechanisms uh, that you can use uh, to make sure that, uh, for example, uh, uh, one server is not replicating to another server that is not elib eligible to be replicated. Uh, this is a lower level mechanism that I didn't mention today, uh, but it does exist and, and basically enables you to, uh, uh, to enforce security uh, on, on also server side components and not just client side to server communication. Okay, thank you. And the next question is, how can I manage the user's access across the cluster? Okay, so I assume this, <coughs> this question refers to uh, um, the fact that the currently it's file-based um, and, and, and how we can actually distribute uh, the security configurations across the cluster. Uh, so like I mentioned during the demo, there are a bunch of ways to do that. Uh, the first one, of course, is having this file uh, located in a shared uh, disk somewhere. Uh, typically, it would be NFS. Um, <coughs> then once you do that, basically all the components access this central location. And you can update this file. Uh, and, and, and that way, the, uh, the permissions and, and roles and, and users are updated uh, across the cluster. Another option that we provide out of the box um, is the support for HTTP file locations. So what you can do, you can actually put uh, this file behind an, H an HTTP server. And of course, Gigaspace comes bundled with, with uh, such a server. And you can put that behind the server. And then all of the running services would access this file via HTTP and read its contents. And then you can update the file from, uh, from one location. And all the uh, read services would, uh, would be able to read this file. On the longer term, <coughs> you could do two things. One is you can extend uh, the default security implementation uh, to provide more sophisticated uh, uh, authentication authorization mechanisms. Uh, for example, integrate with an LDAP server. Um, or you can wait for our uh, next release, uh, which will support, uh, uh, for example, LDAP out of the box and will enable this type of, uh, uh, of authentication authorization. Okay, thanks, Louis. And the last question is, um, do I need to log in to each node separately? All right. Um, so the answer is, uh, is yes and no. Uh, under the hood, what Gigaspaces does actually is once you uh, issue a login command, uh, whether it's through the user interface, as I did now, or through, for example, the administrative API, then it would go to each of the running components and log into them. But it does so under the hood. So as a user, um, this is not exposed to you. Basically, all you do is uh, uh, type in a single login command, and this would get propagated across the cluster. Uh, and that's why, for example, if you go back to the demo, what you can see here is the authentication monitor, which basically uh, lists all the components that you've logged into. Right. So at this point, I'd like to thank you, Uri, and the audience. Uh, we are going to end the webinar. Um, we would appreciate it if you could please fill out the survey. 
Um, please note that in a few days we will also send you a link to the recorded webinar as well as the Q&A session. And thank you all and have a great day. Thank you.